it seemed to him. Remember, he started with 60. He left Haram when he was 75. And now, after 15, 20 years, he's beginning to understand some of God's plan and some of God's purposes with his life. But he still did not have a son. The promise remained valid. Even though his heart was gelling with God and he was starting to understand what God had for him and some of the things that he had to be trained in, he started to be trained in, the promise still seemed barren. And when you look at the promise that is barren except and not to the fullness of God concerning that promise, you will again make mistakes. How many of you understand that? We have to see the promise from the perspective of the fullness of God's character. I am completely convinced, Abram said, and it is written Romans of, of Abraham when he was older. He said, I'm completely convinced that God is able to do what he said he will do. I'm, I'm convinced of his character. I will rest. That he, he learned over time. Because you know what? When he saw the barrenness of the problem, he, he tried to make his own plan. What was his own plan? Ishmael. Ishmael. It seemed to be okay. Listen, Lord, I'm getting to that age now where it seemed to be impossible for me to have children. Let me help you. It's either Sarah or me, but there's a problem somewhere. So let me try it with, with this lady. And, and she got, she got, so it was Sarah, it was Abram. So she got, but swung her in England. Pregnant. And Ishmael was born. And Ishmael was a group Baba for the Bifinah. Need to part when you found out here. From the beginning, it caused division. How many of you know that if you marry long enough and you get a baby with someone else, it causes trouble? Huh? Even if you might have thought, I'm helping God fulfill His promise, it causes problems. And for 13 years, Abram is stuck in the problems with Ishmael and his mom. 13 years! Ken made a mistake. Couldn't wait. Saw the, the promise, but he saw it through the eyes of famine. Remember what he did with famine? He all, again tried to make his own. How many of you have tried to help the Lord? Lord, you said this, so let me help you. I learned the hard way. We just planted the church, Tara. That was when you were still not born. So we planted, we planted the church. John wasn't even there many moons ago. And... Um, Honey was there. Where's Honey? I saw, I saw her just now. She's with the kiddies outside. Honey was there. And we, we got a, a space in, in, on top of a, a shopping center. So uh, the two doors, the one went into the pub and the other one into the church. Yeah? Nice place to have a church. Eh? God always put me in such weird places. I was praying about this and saying, Lord, why me, Lord? Well, I can't find any, and of course Andre phoned me, I don't even know if he remembers. And he said to me, I've got a word for you, Carl. God says a diamond is best seen on a dark background. I said, okay, I know it's the right place, I'll take it. The church next to the pub. So we had to fight, you know, they say two smells keep people in a church lingering afterwards. The smell of coffee, not in a church but in a pub, the smell of alcohol keeps people lingering. So people lingered in our church, but I, we had coffee, but I'm not sure if it was the coffee or the other one. Eh? <laughs> but God used that. But I said to the Lord, listen, Lord, I'm a young man. I want to build this church. We need to grow this thing. I, I need, uh, I'll help you. I'll go to the bank and get a loan to, to put in a nice coffee shop with books and with shelves and everything. Eh? So I went to the bank. Didn't even ask the Lord, I just felt it was in the will of the Lord. And you know, a church has to have a, a bookshop and a coffee shop, right? So I went, got the loan, we fitted that whole thing, never sold one book. We drank a lot of coffee, but it cost me about 70, 60,000 rand. The church promised us to pay it back, they never did that, I had to pay it on my own. 
and it was a hassle. Huh? That's where I learned that God only pays for what He ordered. If I want steak and He wants cream millis and pup, then He'll pay for the pup and the millis, but I'll have to pay for the steak. Amen? So, Abraham made a plan. I'm going to help God. And then he realized Ishmael was not the one. And you know what? God kept quiet. As with me, he didn't speak. And eventually, after 13 years, God spoke with him. God broke the silence. Genesis 17, verse 1 to 8. He said, Ishmael is not the one. Ishmael is not the answer. The in-between time, we've spoken about it in faith. Where do you spend most of your time? In between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. The in-between time is like winter is to nature. It prepares you for summer. But when God speaks again, summer comes, fruitfulness comes, growth comes. 13 years later, and Abram hears from the Lord again. And he understood there is no plan B. There is only a plan A. Now, Abram is 99 years old. 99 years old. There is no need, there is no fear money. There is no way that he can get a child on his own. Now, he thought he, thought he was still okay, but he looked at Sarah and said, My word, <laughs> nothing is possible anymore. Then God spoke to him and God said, Now, you will not be Abraham, but Abraham. Abram, Abraham, Abraham, which means father of multitudes. And when all things seem impossible, the impossible happened. And if in God caused Isaac to be born. Isaac to be born. No plan B, just plan A. I want to end off. You know the story. Then one morning, after Abraham had been trained to see beyond the barrenness of the promise towards the fullness of God in the promise, he sort of started to realize it's not about me, not about me, but it's all God. One morning God said to you, take your son and go to Uriah. And sacrifice your son at Uriah. Just think of that. 40 years, from 60 to 100, all the things he had gone through, God said to you, go sacrifice your son. Abraham never once, never once, got depressed, got rebellious, asked questions. Because in 40 years, he learned plan A is plan A. My job is to be obedient and to do it. God will make a way. And as he was traveling, and walking the road to that mountain and starting to climb the mountain in Romans we read about this he, he had a revelation of Christ see the secret thing things of the world it is not cheap the stuff I teach you is not cheap cheap comes with a lot of suffering. When God reveals deep and secret sins to you, He knows He can trust you with it. And on this journey, Abram's eyes was no longer on the barrenness of the promise, but his eyes were on the fullness of God's ability, character, the beauty him who said and you know the story God made a way God honored him and he became the 
father of our faith. The Bible says God accredited him his faith equals his righteousness in God. He obtained the promise. Philippians 3 verse 10 to 8. You could go read that. That's beautiful. And also Hebrews 6 verse 15. As he was going, his servants asked him, Where are you going with Isaac? What did he, what did he say to his servants? I'm going to the Lord to worship. Patiently enduring the promise, waiting, walking, making mistakes, but still going. God calls that worship. It is an act of worship when you obey God. An act of worship when you obey God. Against the odds, hope against hope. Eyes not on the problem, eyes on the solution, Jesus. Genesis 2 22, verse 5, it says, Abram told the people that was with him that he was going and he was going to worship. And then he was going to bring the child back. Isn't that good? He didn't doubt it. He knew God would make a way for him. And that was accredited to him. So that today we call him the father of our faith. Alright. How can I avoid Abram's mistakes? Let me hear from you guys. What do you think? How can we avoid it? What was the biggest thing that drew Abram away from God's promise? Trying to do things in his own strength. What does the Bible say about that? It says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. So we need to guard our hearts. For from the heart flows, it is the wellspring of life, the Bible says. Eh? So you have to guard your heart. So, we have to understand that. If we understand that, we sort of know that there's a thing like we can have a bias, a personal bias towards things, and we lose our subjectivity. Is that right? Because of our hearts. People think it is God who said it. Because it sounds like God. And it is good. No, it's famine. It sounds good to me to go to Egypt. Because there is money. And there I can sustain my family. So I'll do it. Come on. What I'm going to do is biblical, so, so it should be okay if I do it. That I'm building a, a coffee shop and a, and a stuff for the church. God will surely pay for that. It's going to be okay. Huh? Many people confuse their conscience and God's purposes. And they are led by their personal biases and not by God's word and by God's purposes. How can I avoid this? Number one, when God's word is not consulted, I fall into the strength. I've got to hear from God's word, number one. Number two, when we ignore other Christians' advice. When other Christians come and you ask for advice, you ignore it, you, you you don't listen to prophetic word. You don't align yourself with prophetic word. That's number two. Number three, your ego gets in the way. It takes matters into their own hands. Be watchful about that. Number four, 
we make the mistake when we go out of our rest in Him, even though we are sincere and zealous for the Lord, but it's still not plan A. And then the last one, pride. We need to be on guard for pride, for pride will lead you down a road that will take you far away from God's original design. Now God used Abram's mistakes, Sarah's mistakes, to get them eventually to the fulfillment of their promise. May I, in Jesus' name, not be 99 before my promise is fulfilled. Amen?